There's a lady, uh, I'm sure you've probably never heard of her. Her name was, uh, was at the time, uh, Lilia Morris, uh, born in uh, 1862, uh, died in 1929. Uh, but if you know anything about her, she was, she was quite the woman. Uh, when she would uh, clean her house, she was very um, melodic, loved to sing, uh, loved to write uh, lyrics. And so she was uh, constantly... Uh, going around the house, cleaning the house when her husband wasn't home and singing. In her lifetime, she wrote 1,000 lyrics for hymnic concepts. A thousand. Now, I took 10 years of piano. I don't know that I could, I can write the music part, but the lyric part is hard for me. So I can play and stuff and make up stuff, but the lyric part is, that one's tough. A thousand? Are you kidding me? Now, you may not know her hymns, the hymns that she has written, uh, but when I give this one to you, you're going to totally know who this lady is. Uh, and, and bear in mind, when, when I give you the words of this particular old hymn, realize that for most of, like, much of her married life, she was blind when she wrote these things. Uh, as she anticipated the arrival of Jesus for his church, the glory of that moment, this is what she wrote. It's an old hymn. Jesus is coming to earth again. What if it was today? Coming in power, love to reign. Question is, what if it was today? Coming to claim his chosen bride, which is the church, all the redeemed and the purified over the whole earth scattered wide. What if it was today? I love the chorus, glory, because that's what you're going to see when you see him. Glory is, speaks of his brightness. Glory, glory, joy to my heart will, will bring glory, glory, when we shall crown him king. Glory, glory, haste to prepare the way. Glory, glory, Jesus is gonna come someday. What if it was today? Uh, when I was in uh, high school singing this song, because we, uh, in my church back in the 60s and 70s, we, you know, we did a lot of hymns, plus those new choruses with Pass It On and all that stuff. Remember those things? It only takes a spark to get a, yeah, that whole thing. <laughs> uh, all my friends at high school didn't quite understand that particular song in the 60s, but, but anyway, um, when we would sing this song, I would sit in a church and think to myself, uh, wow, man, if it was today that Jesus appeared, would I be ready? I mean, would I change anything? Would I modify anything? I mean, what if it was today? And I would submit to you, if you aren't a Christian today uh, and have never professed Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're not ready for when he appears for you. So I would submit to you, today's the day to come to terms with the person work of Christ uh, and kneel before him in faith and ask him to prepare you to make you his child, because when he does appear, because he's gonna appear, uh, it won't be ha'o. Oh. You'll be going, oh yes. You know, what if it was today? As a Christian, uh, if the Lord was to appear today, would you make any modifications? Would you change anything, how you do things? Uh, anything you'd need to confess? Anything you'd need to get with the program concerning? Psalm 95 is the kind of psalm that helps you get prepared for what if it was today? Uh, this is called, uh, in theological circles, an enthronement psalm. Uh, because they're going to enthrone the Messiah. So when you look at the, the Hebrew of this uh, text and you look at um, the movement of the argument of the author, uh, you will see it builds like a musical piece to a crescendo. The crescendo is verses 10 to 13, where he says, it's a guaranteed fact that the Messiah is going to appear and be the king of kings. It's a fact. And what he's going to do is he's going to tell you prior to establishing that great crescendo, he's going to tell you what you should be doing prior to his arrival because if it was today, you would want to make sure that you're ready for him to appear, correct? So when you look at this particular uh, passage, uh, there's one simple motif that runs out through the whole thing, that all the different stanzas, there's four stanzas, uh, they all validate this premise. What's the premise? Well, because the, the, the creator, the Messiah is coming, that should impact our lives as, as Christians. We should get going. Why? Well, because we tend to get lazy. Remember COVID? You remember it? You're still remembering it? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's just like, you know, it, were, it, was, it was tough. Uh, and it's so great, uh, by the way, to preach to, this is my first Sunday in over a year to preach to a church where you basically don't have mask on. It is so hard to speak and you can't read people's faces. Like, did they get that humor? Did they not? Are they hate me? Do they, what? I mean, it's hard to read an audience. This is, this is awesome. Now I know what you're doing while you're sitting where you're sitting. Only a few rows back because the rest I can't see you. Don't worry. <laughs> But, you know, if Jesus is, is coming, we need to get going uh, and, and, and get with the program. Um, 
But his coming, as we know biblically, is imminent. Now, we're studying the book of Revelation on Sunday nights for an hour, 6.30 to 7.30. We're starting again because I was off for surgery. So uh, they are, um, we're jumping into chapter 6 tonight if you want to read ahead uh, about the, the Lord's return to the earth to reclaim uh, everything for his kingdom. But, but his kingdom is always in a state of imminency. It's a, it's a doctrine of imminency that, that he is at the door, could come at any moment. So you should, you should be ready. Uh, when I left the PhD program in Hebrew when I was 27 at Dallas Seminary, um, I took a job uh, as a forklift driver in a warehouse loading pallets uh, of 2,000 pounds of paper all day long. That's all I did. So I went from Hebrew exegesis, all that stuff, to driving a forklift. And none of the people I was with understood shalom or anything. <laughs> and God conditioned my soul for my first job as a pastor in that year that I did that. But I, I, I got to understand what it was like to have a blue-collar job and work really hard, uh, and uh, I learned a lot about people. One of the things I noticed interesting in this massive 100,000 square foot warehouse was if the boss left, because he did occasionally, if he left and said, I'm gonna be back, say it's 11, uh, he says, I'm gonna be back at two, everybody basically kept working. You know, and everybody was obedient. But if he didn't tell you when he was gonna come back, he just kind of left it open, you know, and, or, or it was the reverse of that. So if he told you he's coming back, you know, uh, people, you know, but if he didn't say, People, they were claiming, I don't know, he could, he could come in any moment. So they would, they would drive the forklifts, load the paper and everything like that. But it was interesting working in a warehouse, watching that dynamic of work. Because I looked at it through the lens of theology. Because the boss to me was kind of like the coming of the kingdom. You know, so if, I, if he's gone, I'm looking at the workers going, wow, uh, they have no idea when he's coming back. So they're staying on the job. But if they knew he wasn't coming back till two, they would kind of like float. See, as a Christian, I, hopefully I'll get this through your head. You do not know the hour of your Lord's coming, correct? Therefore, what should happen in your life? Well, I should, I should get my act together, correct? What do I need to do? Well, that's what the psalmist is going to tell you. First thing you should do, 1 to 3, verses 1 to 3, first stanza. He says, you should get going in light of the Messiah's coming with your worship. So you're here so you can check this box, correct? What does he say? Sing to the Lord a what? An old hymn from the 1850s. Something my parents knew. Did he say that? Did he say that? No. Sing to the Lord a what? New song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Proclaim good tidings of his salvation uh, from day to day. Tell of his glory among the nations uh, and his wonderful deeds among all of the people. So this is very interesting. Uh, when you read this in the Hebrew text, uh, what you find here is in these three verses, you find six commands. Six. So a command means it's not a what? It's not a suggestion. Well, you know, uh, God, God wants you to sing if you understand that you're a half note off or not. So do you understand, like, if, if somebody's singing next to you and they're flat, do you know they're flat? Do you try to minister to them to tell them, ah, oh, you're a bit, your pitch is off? No, do you think God looks down from heaven and says, you got tonal issues, don't sing? Do you think God does this? No, he says, I'm so happy that you're worshiping. So he just says, sing, sing. So he, he, he says this by command three times. Uh, you could say, like, sing to the Lord uh, three times here in, in the opening text. It's kind of like Trinitarian, is it not? And he's telling you, it's not a suggestion. When you come to worship, what should you be singing? Well, before you had that mask on, correct? Wasn't it difficult to sing with that thing on? I mean, you're like, you're suffocating. Now you should be, you should have been totally excited to sing this morning because air, air. So sing, sing to the Lord. And he tells you, uh, not optional, when you come to worship, you should sing uh, to me. That's who you're singing to. And, and it's a command. It's not optional. So whether you can sing on key, off key, have an amazing voice, don't have an amazing voice, doesn't matter. He says you should sing. And what kind of song you should sing? Well, a new song. What, why, why a new song? I mean, what's, gr what's wrong with How Great Thou Art? Do, do you like How Great Thou Art? I do. Any other oldies do you, you, that you like? Just that one? What? The Old Rugged Cross. Great is Thy Faithfulness. They sang at my mom's sister's funeral when she died at 52 of cancer. I cried while we sang it. Still can't sing it. What else? Amazing Grace. And even, it's interesting, even the lost know that one. They do. They do. So you can, all these old hymns, I mean, I play them all the time at home, uh, worship songs, but I'm reading the text this week and I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be tough. <laughs> Sing a what? A new one. 
a, a, a new song. I cannot tell you how many times our worship team over the last 13 years, they'll, they'll do a new song and somebody from the church will come to me and say, you know, why are we doing that? Why are, we, why, why, why are we singing a new song? I mean, what, what, what about leaning on the everlasting arms? I mean, what, well, what does it say in the Bible? What does he say? Why are you so quiet all of a sudden? Sing unto the Lord a new song. Now think about this. Why would, the, why would the Lord want a new song? I mean, what's wrong with the oldies? Well, those are all awesome songs, doctrinally speaking. No doubt about it. I mean, uh, his eye is on the sparrow. I still can't sing that one. We sang that when my roommate's mom died at 42 when I was in college from ovarian cancer. Glenda, awesome woman, went to her funeral, uh, cried as a young guy. I mean, I still can't sing that song. Nothing wrong with those songs. But they don't all encompass the greatness of God because new Christians are finding out new things about God, new depths of God. He's infinite. So how could you say, well, just this quadrant of songs covers it all? No way. So when you get a new one by somebody, like say uh, Chris Tomlin comes up with a new one, you want to go, oh, I want to hear that one. And when the worship team says, we want to sing a new one, you should be going, awesome, hallelujah. You should become Pentecostal at that moment. <laughs> totally excited. Thank you. There's one. Yes. But anyway, we're such a thinking church. I have to say this occasionally, but you understand. So he says, you know, sing me a new song. So when you see the new songs coming, don't be sitting there telling your wife, it's another new song. I'll do it. I don't really want to do it, but hallelujah, I'll do it. Uh, no, it should be excited. Okay, too convicting again. We're moving on. Who are you supposed to be singing to? He says, sing me a new song. And notice he says, sing it to the Lord three times here, L-O-R-D capitalized. Not capital L, small, small O-R-D. That's Adonai. This is capital letters. So is God shouting at you? No. Well, maybe. But now, this, why does he say, sing it to, to me using this name, L-O-R-D? So this in the Hebrew text is uh, translated Yahweh or Jehovah. So this comes from the Hebrew word, verb hava. So when, when Moses went to the burning bush and wanted to know, if you want me to go deliver Israel, I got to have a name. What's your name, God? God says, I love verbs. <laughs> is it not true? He says, um, I'm picking, you know, I want the verb I am. Tell them I am sent you. What a name. So this is the capital L-O-R-D. It's the great I am name of God. It's a verb. So it's basically the Greek equivalent is ontos, the, the beingness of God. So he always is. He always is. So he's outside of time and space. He's not inside our dimensionality restricted here. He's in it. He's outside of it because he's transcendent and he's, um, he's imminent. Um, he's outside of the chain of cause and effect. I mean, and doesn't it just bug you when you're thinking about like, okay, cause, effect, cause, okay, so who made God? What's the answer? Do you know? N nobody made God. Why? Well, he's in effect with no causation. Well, that's impossible. No, it's not because he's God. He, he is unmade. He is who he is. He's the, he is, so he's infinite. And so he says, when you're worshiping me, remember my great name. This is the pivotal foundational name of God. So in Genesis 1.1, when it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, uh, it's, it starts out with a pre prepositional phrase, bait, Be'oreshet, be in the beginning, is emphatic in Hebrew. Then it says, Ha'elohim, God, created the Hashemayim, the heavens, and the earth, Ha'eretz. He made all these things by the power of his, his, his word, We'll get to that in just a minute. But he says, I'm the great one who started all this cause effect. Worship me. That's my foundational name. When you think about the greatness of God's name, it spills over into his other names, doesn't it? I mean, think about it. The I am name is used in the concept of uh, El Shaddai, the mighty God. His great I am name is also called uh, Jehovah Jireh. So he's the God who provides for his people. Uh, he's uh, uh, the great I am, Jehovah Rapha, uh, which is the God who heals. Uh, he's the great I am who is called Jehovah or Yahweh Shema, uh, which means that he's the God who is there. When I graduated from uh, college in 1980 from Azusa Pacific University, uh, now I can read books that I want to read. You know what I'm talking about? Not what they assign you to read. So I start reading every book by Francis Schaeffer that I can find. Because I understand, okay, they schooled me in Greek and, and, and all that stuff in college, but I got to get into apologetics. So I started reading apologetic books and still have, eventually got my doctorate in apologetics, but 
I, I, everything Schaefer had, I started reading. So I read that little 100-page book, He is There and He is Not Silent. Because how do I communicate to a culture that there is a God who's personal, who made all things? How do I, if they reject the scriptures, how do I reason them toward God? This is called classical apologetics. This was that little book. In fact, I led my brother-in-law to Christ at 9,500 feet from the content of this book. Uh, Jehovah Shammah, well, boy is he there, is he not? Who are you worshiping? You're worshiping that God. He, you're worshiping that God. And when you worship that great God who is all of those things, you can bank on the fact that the king is coming. Why? Because he is, then the covenant he gave to Abraham, the Palestinian covenant that he gave to give them the land, and they're thinking they can rocket them off the land. I'm talking about rockets. Is that gonna work? Nope, because the king of kings, that's, that's his land. The Palestinian covenant gives it to him. Uh, the Davidic covenant, second, uh, Samuel 7, uh, he gives them the king. The king is coming, the messianic king. Jeremiah 30, 31, he's going to give them the, the nation, save the nation, give them a new heart. And we get in on the new covenant as the goyim, the, the Gentiles. We get saved when we come to the Messiah. He, he can do all these things because he's the God who is. He's, he's never off duty. And he says, when you worship me, he says, you need to proclaim good tidings of his salvation. And you should do it from day to day. As a figure of speech, day to day is what is called a merism. Uh, and it just means it should happen all the time. Well, why didn't he say that? Because it's more colorful, colorful to say day to day. So you're thinking about the greatness of God. You should be talking all the time about his greatness as it relates to his salvation. If you got saved, it should excite you that you talk about it. The word salvation that is used here uh, in the Hebrew text is uh, Yeshua Ato, which sounds a lot like what? Yeshua Ato. Sounds a lot like Yeshua, which is the name of Jesus. Uh, Matthew 121, uh, when the angel came and, and told the holy couple that uh, they were going to have a child, uh, they, they said, uh, he, you will have a child and you will call his name in the Greek text, Jesus, which is the Greek version of Yasha, Yeshua. Uh, what does it mean? It means God saves. That God in his greatness came to earth to save sinners from their sin, to bring reconciliation between God and man. He says, when you think about me, when you worship me, think about I'm the God who saved you. That should humble you, should humble you. How are you doing about telling people about the fact he saved you? When's the last time you told me? I was getting a phone the other day, a new, a new AT&T phone, and, and the, the man was uh, Hindu. And I've been in the store many times because I have issues because I'm a baby boomer, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and he told me, you know, I was raised in, a, in Catholicism by nuns, but I'm Hindu and Catholic. And he, then he looked at me and he told me, and you know, Pastor, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> Does it matter? Does it matter? Yes, it matters what you believe. Because there's only one Savior. His name is Yeshua. It's Jesus. Uh, are you going to share with that person? It matters. So when you come to worship, you should be talking to them about his salvation, telling of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among the people. You should be teaching them that the Messiah that was prophesied did walk the planet, and the miracles that he did validate that he was God. I mean, that's how he validated who he was. Because he says, if you don't believe my words, look at my works. What did he do? Well, he went to Canaan one day, and uh, he was there for a wedding. I've been to Canaan many times, a little tiny place next to Nazareth, beautiful setting on the hills, not far from Galilee. And he's there at the wedding, and his mom comes to him and says, uh, honey, we're out of uh, Galilee wine, or whatever they used back then. We, we need some wine. You're just freaking out. The pastor knew about Galilee wine. Don't worry. I don't drink. But what, what, what did she ask him to do? Uh, could you make some more? What he do? woman, it is not my hour, <laughs> you know, uh, okay, mom, I'll do it, so what do he do, he turned water to wine, who, who could do that but God, who made water, uh, he healed a leper, he raised a widow's son from the dead, he stole the storm in the middle of a sea, heavy swells, 25 foot waves, and he just walks out on deck and, deck and goes, what, shalom, what happened, you could go skiing, it was flat, See, even the water obeyed him. And the disciples are going, even the wind and the sea obeys his word. Who is he? He's the Messiah, as prophesied. You're worshiping that God when you come to worship. There's nothing more exciting. Number two, get going with your worldview, because worldviews matter, do they not? 
I mean, what's our world doing right now but fighting over worldviews? The only problem is their worldview is not tied to anything. That's absolute. So notice what he says. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all of the gods of the people are what? Idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are his sanctuary. He says, when you think about uh, your worship of God, it has everything to do with the concept of who he is. It's all about worldview. So he's above all gods that you could ever dream up in any Greek, Roman, any pantheon, all the, uh, all the gods of the Hindus, etc. Pick, pick one. He said, those gods are really just idols because there's only one true living God. Uh, you don't see it in the English text here, but when he calls these gods idols, uh, the, the Hebrew word, he, he calls them El Elim, these idols, El Elim. Remember Genesis 1, verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth? That's Elohim. He says Elohim is the true God. El Elim are false gods. See, our world is full of El Elim, false gods. He says, no, God is the great God. He's the true one who made all things. Um, and he tells you, remember when you worship him, because the worldview is he, is he is the one who made the heavens. What does science tell you? <laughs> the opposite of that. Scientism tells you the opposite of that. Uh, and the, the, the scriptures say just the opposite of that. Before there was anything, he made all these things by the word of his mouth, all of the cosmos. He says, you're, you're worshiping that God. That's the proper worldview. Because if I believe that there's a God who made all things, it radically changes me for when the day comes, he appears, I've been worshiping him. But if I don't see that he's the God who made all things, then it does, it, it, there's nothing to impact my morals but me or lack thereof. Think about the greatness of God. I, I love astronomy. I read books occasionally by scientists on astronomy because it fascinates me. Uh, and I was reading, you know, about the greatness of God. It just excites me about how great God is. When you think about the Milky Way galaxy that God made and when he made the heavens, uh, traveling at the speed of light to get across just our galaxy would take 4,000 years traveling at the speed of light. That's traveling a whopping 6 trillion miles a year. And it would take 4,000 years. And you're worried about your life. You know what I'm saying? But you think about the greatness of God and you're like, it's so immense. I was reading this week about the Hubble Space Telescope and they stuck one of the cameras in a quadrant of the deep space that seemed extra dark and they're thinking, is there a black hole there? What's there? So they took a picture. I saw the before picture. Yeah, it's a little square, black. Must be a black hole. Uh, and then they blew it up. And it was spectacular. In the field of what they blew up, they counted 30,000 galaxies. Did you hear me? If you're there going, hey, ain't nothing. Think about what I just said. 30,000 galaxies in one little tiny quadrant, and they're, they're estimating that there are two trillion galaxies based upon that, if they extrapolate. Two, huh, two trillion galaxies. And where's life? In this massive explosion, as the Earth and everything was created, we just ha happened to wind up with life on one planet, Etc. Are you kidding me? No, no. God made the vast heavens and put us here to worship him. We just blew it in the garden, remember? You know, and our sin impacted the entire cosmos. We'll get into that in just a minute. When you think about the magnificence of God, of what he has made, no wonder that's the ultimate worldview. Because if I believe that he made all of these things and I worship him, it's going to change everything about me. If I'm a police officer, it, it, it's how I, I function differently. If I'm a politician, it affects how I do politics differently. I mean, pick the job. If I'm an army colonel, how I treat my troops, etc. If I truly believe there's a God who is above me, I'm accountable to, then if it was today he appeared, he would find that my life was in line with who he is. See, I'm a Christian because I look at the evidence of what God has left behind to show us that he's there. And I reason toward him. And by faith, I embrace him. John Lennox, a great mathematician, said this, Oxford educated, says, can rationality really arise through unguided natural processes working under the constraints of nature's laws on the basic materials of the universe in some random way? Answer, no. Is the solution of the mind-body problem simply that rational mind emerged from mindless body by undirected mindless processes? The answer of the great mathematician is <laughs> no, no. Uh, Alan, Alan uh, Sandage, uh, father of modern-day astronomy, uh, says this. 
I find it quite improbable that such order came out of chaos. There has to be some organizing principle. God to me is a mystery, but is the explanation of the, for the miracles of existence. And then he says, why is there something rather than nothing? Well, because there's a God who is someone. You see, these are great men, great men, who understand the vastness of the cosmos made by a God greater than the cosmos, and they worship him. Uh, that's their worldview. What's your worldview? Because when you realize the Messiah is coming, if you have him in your view, it changes everything about you. Next, he says in verses six to nine, you should get going with your witness. And it kind of stands a reason. If you're worshiping the God who is, it should affect who you're telling that to. Notice what he says, verse seven. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory, strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy attire, tremble before him all of the earth. Does it matter how you come into church dress-wise? I'm from California. I have friends who pre preach in board shorts, rainbow sandals, tank tops. They're cool. Does God accept their worship? Yes. They're always telling me that I need to get my act together. I never did. You can tell. Um, but, but so when he's talking about get, come to God in, with holy attire, he's talking about when you become a Christian, whose righteousness do you get? His. You don't have any. So at the moment of faith, according to 1 Corinthians 1.30, he gives you his holiness. You're clothed in his holiness. So when you come into worship, you can come in and say as a Christian, man, I, I am dressed to the hilt today. So are you, if you know Christ, because you've got the clothing of Jesus. You've got his holiness. And he's telling you here, there's no way that the families of the earth here, the peoples of the earth, which from the Jewish perspective would be the goyim, the Gentiles, are going to be worshiping God here because it's telling you, that, let all the people of the planet ascribe glory to God. There's no way that they would be doing that if someone didn't tell them about God, tell them about Jesus, and then they worshiped him. So this says everything to me about witness, that if you truly believe Jesus is coming, you are going to stop anybody and everybody and tell them, do you know him? Are you clothed in his holiness? Has he forgiven your sin? I mean, like, who's going to be in heaven because you told them? Who will be there? What if it were today? Whose life are you watching to say, you know what, there's something totally different about them? They have a hope. They have a joy in the middle of the societal chaos. I don't know where that's. They seem to have answers to questions. What's up with them? Well, they're a Christian. And then you get alongside them, and all of a sudden their faith becomes your faith. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, in playing the piano, I mean, after I got by all the hand exercises and the arpeggios and all that stuff, and then got past, you know, all the complex things the lady wanted me to play over 10 years, um, I, I really got to play what I like to play. Elton John, <laughs> Journey, Stairway to Heaven. You know, that was just me, you know, and I still do it today. I mean, it's just, I love it. Only problem is Liz tries to talk to me while I'm doing it, and I'm like, Honey, if I'm playing open arms, I can't, I can't talk to you, you know? But anyway, uh, back to my sermon. Uh, what am I, this is not a rabbit trail. You're thinking, where is he going? Uh, so here's the thing. My favorite thing uh, is blues. I love blues. Not jazz. Uh, jazz is fun, but I love blues. But blues is a special technique on, a, on the keys. And so what I do is I get an iPad and I have some of my favorite blues pianists and I get them on the iPad and I stick it, you know, on the... Uh, music holder on the piano, and I, I get the, the AirPods in. Those are wonderful, by the way, right? And, and, and then I, 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 the rift that I want to learn, like what he's doing, I'll, I'll listen to it, and then I'll look at the keys, and I'll look at his hands and go, that's awesome. How do you do that? And then I'll, I'll let him play. He's shooting his hands, and I'm, going, I'm trying to do the same things. You know what I'm saying? And if I didn't quite do it, I'll, like, I play it again. It's totally awesome. And it's free. It's on YouTube. This is spiritual experience, because what has this got to do with what I'm talking about? Everything. Because what am I doing? I'm, I'm trying to play a beautiful melody by getting alongside somebody who's way beyond me. See, isn't that what you're doing when you're lost? Man, my life is messed up. I have no peace, I have no hope, a dysfunction, etc. But that person seems to have it all together. What is it? You find out it's Jesus. They begin to, see, they're like your instructor. And you come alongside them. They tell you about Jesus. You embrace him by faith. And they begin to disciple you. You grow up to be like Jesus. And what should you be doing in light of his return? Telling other people. So they can ascribe greatness to him. Again, 
if it was the day Jesus appeared, how many would be in heaven because you came alongside him? Lastly, he says you got to get going with the warning. I mean, God gets real. What's the warning? Here's the warning. Say to the nations, tell them what? The Lord reigns. Democrats don't reign. Republicans don't reign. Libertarians don't reign. Who reigns? The Lord reigns. Uh, indeed, the world is firmly established. It will not be moved. He will judge the peoples when he shows up. He'll do it with equity. You can't bribe him. You, you, you can't pay him off. You can't shop around for a judge that gives you a ruling like you want to hear. No, 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 he's God. He will judge with equity when he shows up. It says in verse 11, let the heavens be glad, let the earth rejoice, let the sea roar, and all that it contains, all the fish, let him, let him praise God. Let the field exult and all that is in it. Then all the trees of the forest will sing for joy. Boy, are they now, are they not? <laughs> anyway, just stepping aside. It's not about cicada. But anyway, coming back to the text. <laughs> Why in the world, okay, so what's the warning? So the warning is this, God reigns, the Lord reigns, capital L-O-R-D, the all-existent one reigns in the heavenly sphere now and in the earthly sphere now. But when Jesus appears and comes back to the earth, he will rule from Jerusalem as prophesied in, in Isaiah too. He will rule from Jerusalem. So boy, will he, he reign, but he reigns right now. What does our world forget today as they move through their life and deconstruct everything? What are they forgetting there is a living God who reigns supremely. He's the essence of all truth and he will hold all men accountable. And notice what he says, verse 13. Uh, do all of this. The, the planet, by the way, is, is excited. I mean, everything. And that goes back to Romans 8 if you want to read it in your small group uh, because the, the, our sin impacted the entire cosmos. And so when, when the Lord comes back to deal with sin and, the, and Satan and to bring his kingdom of peace and the planet gets to be released from the bondage to sin, if a tree could sing, the maple would be singing and the oak, all of them, the fish, etc. Because he comes back as the prince of peace to bring, bring peace to the earth. And he says, as you're preparing for his coming, he says he's coming to judge the earth. And it says he will judge the world but in two ways. How will he do it? In righteousness, and he will do it in faithfulness. Righteousness, holiness, his version of holiness, not our watered down, twisted version of holiness, his version of holiness that never changes. And he'll do it in faithfulness. A better translation of the word faithfulness is truth, because the, the Hebrew word here is emet. And emet means truth. Again, what does our culture believe? Truth is relative. There are no absolute truths. And the statement in and of itself is self-defeating because the statement that there's no absolute truth is an absolute statement. I mean, see what I mean? It's, it's the most illogical position of all time. Um, but he, he, he's the essence of truth. He comes to judge mankind when he appears. Are you holy? Are you holy? And where do you get your holiness from? His son, who gives it to you. Are you holy? And I'm gonna judge with truth. Uh, he's gonna come back. We read Matthew 25. You're mine, you're not mine. You're mine, you're not mine, you're not mine, you're not mine. See, you have my holiness, and I will use truth to judge you. You ready for that day? Jesus is coming to earth again. What if it were when? Today. Coming in power, boy, is he with the angels, and love to reign. What if it were today? Coming to claim his chosen bride, all of the redeemed and the purified, over the whole earth scattered wide. What's the question? What if it was today? Glory. If it was today, right? Glory. Yeah. Joy to my heart will bring. Why? Because you'll see him. You'll see him. Are you ready to give account? Are you ready? Let's pray. God, thank you for the enthronement psalm, Psalm 96, that helps uh, the lost understand their need of the Savior. May those who are here in this building online who don't know you, may this be the day in childlike faith. They say, Lord, save me. And you, the great creator, the great savior, will, will save them at that precise moment and make them a child. And we thank you for just this word to us as saints. Might we take these four components and live them out fully to those about us so that when you do come, if it is today, we're ready because we live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. God.